Professor Dr. Strassas Jonathan from USA. Uh, he is a professor in the Radiation Oncology Department at Northwestern University, Feinberg School of Medicine. Uh, he will speak about the role of brachytherapy in gynecological malignancies. You can start now, Professor Doctor. You can start. All right. Well, I am so glad to be here again, uh, this time remotely, although it was a delight to, uh, to be at this conference in person a couple years ago. Um, and I'll be talking a couple times today, and this first one will be a little more informal and hopefully we'll cover some questions it's a fairly broad topic about the role of brachytherapy in gynecologic malignancies. And I would say that there are essentially you know, two diseases where we very often use brachytherapy, and these are endometrial cancer and cervical cancer. And those are the ones that I'll focus on. And I want to talk a little bit about the rationale for brachytherapy and a bit about how we do it, what applicators are available, and a lot of perhaps answering questions. Let's start with endometrial cancer. Uh, so, you know, if we go back a ways and we think about why we do brachytherapy in the setting of endometrial cancer, there were these sister trials, GOG-99 and Portec-1, that looked at external beam pelvic radiotherapy in women with kind of intermediate risk endometrial cancer postoperatively. So, because I'm American, let's look briefly at GOG-99. This enrolled women with FIGO stage one or some stage two occult with any Professor, invasion. No. Julia, please share the presentation. Uh, I'm sorry, is it not being shared? No. My, my apologies. Uh, rookie mistake. How are we doing now? It's yes. good, you can continue, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. So, so GOG 99 again, and we looked at essentially stage one intermediate risk. And these women were treated with a TAH and BSO and a pelvic and periodic nodal dissection, and they were node negative. They were randomized between no further treatment or radiotherapy to the pelvis. And, you know, this is an older trial. So this was 50.4 gray in 28 fractions. It could be delivered with cobalt or with a linac, it could have been given APPA or with a four field box. Uh, and at the time we were using bony landmarks to delineate the upper field border. So it was L4, L5 interspace. In a post hoc fashion, we then stratified these patients between what we called low intermediate risk, which was two thirds of the patients for high intermediate risk, one third. And the factors that got one into high intermediate risk were grades two or three, out or one third invasion of the myometrium or the presence of LVI as a binary, absent or present. And, and for older women, for those over 70, they needed a single risk factor. For those 50 to 70, they needed two risk factors. In under 50, they needed all three risk factors in order to be considered high intermediate risk. What we found was that pelvic radiotherapy reduced the risk of a pelvic recurrence, but the absolute benefit was much larger in women who were high intermediate risk than those who were low intermediate risk. But what we also found was that if we looked at, these are the women who did not receive radiotherapy, if we look at where their recurrences in the pelvis were, the vast majority were vaginal. By contrast, in the radiotherapy arm, there were but two vaginal recurrences, and actually both were in women who refused radiotherapy. So pelvic radiotherapy was doing a very good job in eliminating these vaginal recurrences, but did we really need to treat the whole pelvis when the patterns of failure in this population were mostly vaginal? Well, here the Europeans performed Portec 2 to help us answer this question. And they enrolled essentially women, if we look without deep invasion grade three, so it could be deep invasion grades one or two or anybody with sh or shallow invasion grade three. And they all underwent TAHBSO, only suspicious lymph nodes removed, which is how the European trials have tended to function. And women were randomized between external beam radiotherapy to 46 gray and 23 fractions versus vaginal brachytherapy using probably our most common approach, which is seven gray 
prescribed to 0 0.5 cm depth times three fractions. And what Portec 2 told us was, number one, not surprisingly, we had fewer pelvic recurrences if we treated the whole pelvis. These are nodal pelvic recurrences. However, both treatments were equivalent with regard to vaginal recurrences. So vaginal brachytherapy worked just as well. And there was no difference in survival between these treatments because the risk of pelvic recurrence was quite low in this population. And having said that, our toxicities were far superior in the vaginal brachytherapy arm as compared to the pelvic radiotherapy arm. This was true for, with regard to patient reported outcomes on social functioning, on diarrhea or fecal leakage, on urinary urgency. Meanwhile, sexual function was equivalent between the two arms, but lower than age match controls, perhaps in part reflecting the surgery in which the cervix and part of the vagina was removed and in part radiotherapy, which can cause stenosis or shortening or drying in the vagina. Now, I will say there are some cool subset analyses coming out of here where we might ask, well, are there any of these women who should really be receiving pelvic radiotherapy as opposed to vaginal brachytherapy? And it does look like one can delineate a pretty small high-risk group looking at unfavorable features. So this is extensive LVI. If we were to look at LVI on a spectrum, there's some cool data that it looks like focal LVI is not nearly as prognostically significant, but extensive LVI is quite poor, as well as a few molecular signatures that I think we're going to see the poor tech group continuing to work on in the future. So those patients perhaps would benefit from pelvic radiotherapy over vaginal brachytherapy, but the vast majority of these patients are going to do well with vaginal brachytherapy. Do we need to do vaginal brachytherapy as compared to nothing? We don't really have a great trial for this, so I'll bring in an NCDB analysis. This is a very large American cohort database study. Um, and what we see is that in, in America, most women with stage 1A, so shallow invasion, and about half of women with stage 1B or deeper invasion don't get vaginal brachytherapy, despite the fact that, especially for women with stage 1B, there did appear to be a, a reduction in mortality associated with the use of vaginal brachytherapy. So it actually is pretty important. It is better to prevent vaginal cuff recurrences than to try to treat them. We don't salvage all of them. Um, and if we look at big series that have looked at the rates of salvage, they hover around 50%. Some are much higher, like we saw in Port Tech 1, but some are lower than 50%. So we don't salvage everyone with a vaginal cuff recurrence. And this really does make vaginal brachytherapy for the right patients pretty important. So how do we deliver this? Well, most of us will deliver this with a vaginal cylinder. It's pretty simple, really. This is what our vaginal cylinder looks like. We can use three or four segments. We choose its size in diameter based on patient anatomy. And in an ideal world, we choose the cylinder that is uh, the largest cylinder a patient can comfortably accommodate. We shouldn't cause her pain but she can feel some fullness or stretching because we really want this cylinder to be directly opposed to the tissue. So it's giving a good dose distribution. We don't want big air gaps between the cylinder and the mucosa. And so we choose that, you know, after an examination, we can estimate the size, we try it out. We can, we don't have to do this with three-dimensional planning. You know, one can have a very simple um, pre-created plan for each cylinder size and chosen length. But we also can do CT planning. One of the things I nice is assuring that there aren't big air gaps, that we've selected the right size cylinder. What dose fractionation scheme do we use? Well, I'll show in just a minute the data that we have. I would say the most commonly used is seven gray prescribed to 0 0.5 cm depth times three fractions. That's what was used in Portec 2. I think many of us believe that's actually a little more dose then we might want to give. When I came to Northwestern, Dr. Small had always been using a slightly gentler regimen, which is what I've adopted and used for the last decade, which is 5.5 gray, prescribed to 0 0.5 CM depth times four. So a little gentler than our seven. Remember that the surface dose is often about 1.5 times the dose prescribed at 0 0.5 CM. So it can get pretty hot. Um, there are other fractionation schemes that are used that sometimes you know, some people use five gray times five or six prescribed to the surface. Um, but we do have uh, a Portec trial right now that's a dose versus dose trial that I think is gonna answer this question well. How long do we treat? For most of us, this does vary. 
based on uh, histology, I will often treat about three centimeters of the vagina, which is pretty short. I think that gives us less toxicity. I will extend it for papillary serous or clear cell histologies where we sometimes see more skip metastases, or I will also extend it for extensive lymph vascular invasion where I think we can see more skip metastases and I'll treat more like five centimeters. Um, and so, oh, yes? Perhaps not. So a point, we did have one published trial that was a dose versus dose trial out of Sweden. It was relatively small. I think the challenge in this study was that the women included were all at very low risk. So shallow invasion to no invasion, grade one or two. And these are women who we would very often now omit brachytherapy for. And what we saw in this study is there was very clearly a difference in mucosal atrophy. It was, or I should say, we randomized women between five grade times six, 0.5 skip depth, or half that dose. 2.5. And so what we saw was there was very clearly a difference in mucosal atrophy and bleeding. The gentler dose regimen caused less toxicity. There was no difference in local recurrence, but my challenge is I'm not sure if, if we could expect much in the way of local recurrence in this population. So it made it difficult for me to know if this would be equivalent in a population with a real recurrence risk. That's why I'm really waiting for, for the next PORTEC trial to help me know the optimal dose. And I'm a little reluctant to go too low, but I hope we can go lower. I hope we can derive the benefits of this treatment with even less mucosal toxicity in the future. I will point out when we're treating recurrent disease at the top of the vagina. So when you see a patient who did not get vaginal brachytherapy and has a recurrence at the vaginal cuff, now our brachytherapy options are somewhat different. For those whose disease is less than five millimeters after pelvic radiotherapy, then I will still choose a vaginal cylinder. But for a disease that's thicker, what we can see is if this is our prescription dose line, we can see that for a thicker tumor, a lot of the tumor will be farther out than we can cover effectively with dose that's coming from a line source through a single central catheter in the cylinder. And for those patients, I favor an interstitial approach in which needles are placed through the tumor and a more homogeneous dose that covers the entire tumor to be used. And this really depends on both how big the tumor was at the start and also whether it shrank to external beam radiotherapy. And I'll usually start with 45 gray and 25 fractions to the pelvis and follow that with vaginal brachytherapy or with brachytherapy of some type. Hopefully I can use a cylinder, but when I can't effectively cover the tumor volume, I'll use the And I will say we advise dilator use for our patients after either vaginal brachytherapy or cervical brachytherapy to try to prevent agglutination, shrinkage, shortening of the vagina for better physical exams, sexual functioning. Um, and one of my patients did send me this. It's a big tower in Europe. And she took a picture of herself in front of it saying, hey, this looks just like that dilator you give me. So I use that as a reminder. It's important to, to uh, recommend dilator use, I think, at least for women who desire to be sexually active after treatment. Um, and so what about for cervical cancer? Well, the first thing I'll just mention is brachytherapy is a really important treatment for cervical cancer. And we don't have randomized trials trying to leave out brachytherapy. The best we've got here is a SEER analysis from America that just looked back at women who did not receive brachytherapy and compared them to those who did. When adjusting for all other known prognostic factors, what we see is disease-specific survival, so death from cervical cancer was much higher, or disease-specific survival was lower for women who did not receive brachytherapy. By contrast, there was no difference in non-cervical cancer survival. There was a big difference in disease-specific and overall survival. So brachytherapy saves lives in cervical. So how do we do it? There are different approaches. I will say at our institution, we moved several years ago to an MRI-guided high-dose rate brachytherapy approach, although for many years we had success using a low-dose rate brachytherapy approach that used two-dimensional imaging, but I think for those who can, it's preferable to move on to uh, image guidance and high-dose rate brachytherapy if it's available. And we, we cured a lot of women without it, but I do think we do a little better with it. Um, how do we do this? We prefer at around week four or so, to uh, go to the operating room with our gynae oncology colleagues, so the one could do this without them, and suture in a Smith sleeve. So identify the cervical os um, under ultrasound if need be. Often I, I like that as a backup, suturing in this sleeve. 
This is an open-ended Smith sleeve, although we now use closed-ended ones more routinely, suturing it into the cervix. If there's too much tumor, sometimes you have to wait till beyond the fourth week in order to do this. And that way we can then place our tandem later on without having to redilate each time. It's easier to do in our brachytherapy suite outside of the OR. We, what we will typically use is a tandem and ring applicator, although a tandem and ovoids are perfectly good as well. And so we place the tandem through the Smith sleeve into the uterus and we put the ring in direct that position right up against the cervix. And we really, want, we really want that ring to get up there. So we'll use the largest ring that can fit all the way up to the cervix. Sometimes we'll see some vaginal narrowing and you don't wanna use too large a ring that doesn't get to the cervix. Um, then we like to do MRI guidance. Now we don't have an MR simulator in our department. So we tend to just do MR planning for our first fraction and not use it for the additional fractions. But I do really think this will help us see the tumor really well. And I think making sure that that tumor is covered as well with the prescription dose is really important. And I do think this is an advantage. And I will also say, I think as we've shifted to MRI guidance and we've been better able to look at normal tissue doses compared to what we were doing in the two-dimensional era, I do think we see less rec bleeding and toxicity. And we've done better organ sparing and better tumor coverage if it's available to do image guidance. And I do love MR once you get used to it. Sometimes the tumor will be broader than we can cover with kind of a line source up the tandem, in which case we'll add needles through fenestrations in the ring. It can be really valuable in allowing you to push those laterally without pushing it anterior or posterior into the bladder and rectum. And I have found those very useful when we can't encompass disease, even with that, we'll switch to an interstitial approach. We used to use what's called a Syed Neblet template. We've switched for some sterilization reasons to using the Venezia approach, but this uses a tandem, a ring. We can do needles through the ring and we can do needles through the interstitial template, but there are other approaches. This happens to be the applicator we use. There are other approaches that allow you to put needles through the perineum, and then you can cover well more broadly for tumors that simply you can't be accommodated by the dose distribution one would get with a uh, tandem and ovoids or tandem and ring. And I will point out too, sometimes you have to cover dose farther down the vagina. There are two ways to do that from my point of view. One can do an interstitial approach. So here I show a woman with some vaginal involvement that was tricky, and we actually used an, an interstitial approach to cover that disease very well. And I'll say she's disease-free and doing great now. And the other approach for tumors that have a lot of vaginal extension but aren't that broad is to use a tandem and a vaginal cylinder. This is a multi-channel vaginal cylinder, so we can steer the dose pretty well to wherever the dose was here. You know, we can put in catheters into this multi-channel cylinder. And what I like about it here is a woman with a lot of posterior vaginal involvement. I try, if I can avoid it, to not put needles through the posterior vagina, through the rectovaginal septum. I think our risk of a rectovaginal fistula gets high if we implant that with interstitial needles. So my preference, if possible, is to do this with a multi-channel cylinder. So here you can see we could project those into the low cervix, into the low, into the cervix, but also down the vagina. We projected those preferentially posteriorly, where she had this bulky vaginal tumor, despite a very slow response to external beam and a pretty tough tumor. We were able to push in enough dose to get long-term pelvic control for this very uh, kind of radiation insensitive tumor. I will say this patient unfortunately succumbed to distant disease, but, but we controlled her pelvis and we could do this with a multi-channel cylinder that allowed us to project dose posteriorly down the vagina. So I'm gonna pause for a minute. I think I've covered the main techniques that we use and the main rationale, but I really wanna leave this open to questions. Please continue, Professor Doctor. You can continue. You can continue. Start. I see. Yes. Well, yes. Talk. yeah. So, so sure. So my presentation is is done. But what I will do now, I suppose, is see if there are any questions in the audience. Um, and oh, excuse me. And if there are not, um, I can. And we have a little extra time. I can return to talking a little bit more about the approaches that we use. Yes. Uh, yes. I have a question, please. Yes. Please Thank go you, ahead. Professor Doctor. And now.
questions. Who want to Thank push? you, Dr. Strauss, for your uh, excellent presentation. Uh, regarding uh, vaginal cuff uh, brachy, uh, do you prescribe the dose uh, to 0.5 cm for patients who receive uh, vaginal cuff brachy alone and for those who received external beam plus vaginal cuff brachy? Or sometimes you prescribe it to the surface dose for patients um, or the mucosal surface for patients who received the vaginal cuff brachy alone? This is an excellent question. And, and I would say this. I don't think there's a wrong way to do this because there are different conventions to how we prescribe dose that can both do the job. And for historical reasons, I've prescribed to 0.5 CM depth when I'm treating vaginal brachytherapy alone. And again, I, I usually use, I think a standard, but not the only standard regimen. I tend to use 5.5 grade to 0.5 CM depth times four. Um, we, we do that often maybe twice a week. Um, having said that, it is perfectly acceptable to prescribe to the surface in that circumstance. Alternately, when I'm doing this after vaginal, after pelvic radiotherapy, then I use two different doses. If, if this is in the adjuvant setting, so I just think it's a woman at high risk, she has no gross residual disease, I'll either give 45 gray to the pelvis and six gray to the surface times two or three or I'll give you know, 45 grade to the pelvis, maybe 50 grade to the central pelvis, and then maybe two vaginal insertions of six to the surface. And these are for very high women, in, very high risk women in the adjuvant setting. In the salvage setting, and I'm using a cylinder, so this is a woman who's had a recurrence, then I will tend to prescribe, if I'm using a vaginal cylinder, I will tend to prescribe 45 grade to the pelvis, seven grade times three to 0 0.5 cm depth. Um, and that I took from a GOG, or, you know, the most recent GOG trial that was plus minus this platen in the setting of recurrence, and that was the dose prescription they used. So that's what I've tended to go with. Um, but I don't think, you know, I think it is also reasonable to prescribe to the surface as long as we adjust doses accordingly. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Any question? Any other question? No questions? No. Okay. I, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I will make mention of one other thing, which is I do I do think there's a fair amount of controversy, at least in America, about when we add vaginal brachytherapy in the adjuvant setting. And and we don't have trials that have really asked this question. I, I will make this point. We have moved away from pelvic radiotherapy for most women unless they're pretty high risk. We've moved towards vaginal brachytherapy. So if you compare us to the women who were enrolled in GOG-99 or Portec-1, the women we treat with pelvic radiotherapy are considerably higher risk than those people. We also use a lower dose of external beam radiation than used in those trials. It was 50.4 gray in the uh, GOG-99 and 46 gray by two gray per fraction in, in Portec-1. And we tend to use 45 gray by 1.8. And so, I am not as comfortable with the idea of taking a much higher risk group of women, giving them a lower dose and thinking that'll work out perfectly. And so I tend to add a little, in these women I'm given pelvic radiation, I tend to add something to that central pelvis vaginal cuff that's a little more than 45 gray, whether it's external beam to 50 or whether it's vaginal brachytherapy in some way. I, I just think I, if when you see cuff recurrences after 45 gray, you know, there are attempts at brachytherapy sal salvage, but mostly those women may get a pelvic exenteration. I really hate to see that. And so I, I tend when I'm treating a high risk woman to give a little more than just 45 gray. Uh, okay, many of our, our patients presented with subtotal hysterectomy and the surgeon refused to complete surgery. How can you manage this case? Okay, so, and this is an endometrial cancer or cervical? Yes, endometrial. Okay, well, my first question would be, do you have access to a pelvic MRI? Yes. Perfect. So then you can look at residual disease. And I would say if a patient's gotten a partial hysterectomy, which is, you know, let's be honest, a, a non-oncologic procedure, there, there may be reasons why it had to happen, but a non-oncologic procedure. Now I would tend to give 45 grade to the pelvis, but also, you've got a pelvic MRI, you have a very good sense of where the gross residual disease is. And now we can ask ourselves, is, it, is there no gross residual? 
um, in which case maybe a vaginal cuff uh, boost is enough. Um, if we think that covers the tissue that's remaining. And if not, um, I would probably give, if there's no gross residual, I would probably give the tissue that's remaining external beam to at least 50. If there is gross residual, I would implant that and, and take that to, you know, depending on your fractionation scheme, but one can do seven grade times three or five grade times five that goes to the gross residual disease that's implanted after 45 grade to the pelvis. That's, that's a tricky position for a rat onc to be in. I'm, and I would, I'm glad you have experience in handling that. What can I ask? What have you tended to do? Do, do you increase the dose with brachycerapy or, or give the same as in adjuvant for patients with total hysterectomy? Well, I guess I would say this. I, I would tend to give more than 45 if part of the uterus is still in there. And even if you don't see residual disease. And, and now the question is, can you encompass that with a vaginal cylinder? Probably not which means I would probably be using external beam radiotherapy. I'm, I'm not guided by data in this scenario. We don't have good trials for this, um, but I would feel more comfortable giving at least 50 grade to the residual tissue without gross disease uh, at the very least. And then you have to try if possible to respect normal tissue uh, tolerances as well. And it depends a little bit what's nearby, because I bet after this partial hysterectomy, there's small bowel that's plopped right on top of some of your targets, which probably makes things tricky for you too. Thank you very much, uh, Professor S uh, Strauss. Uh, uh, I'd like to thank coach, uh, Professor Nadia Abdelmenaim and Professor Irvat Nagar, who asked us uh, uh, remotely. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, the uh, was closed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.